One of the most essential skills for success in chemistry will be unit conversions and dimensional analysis. Chemistry is a quantitative science, which means numbers matter and so do units. Units tell you what you're measuring and chemistry is full of measurements. Mass, volume, moles, pressure, energy, and every number you use requires units so we can give meaning to the value. The different units that we can see in chemistry come from gas law problems with atmospheres, liters, moles, and kelvin, dilution problems with molarity in liters, energy and heat problems with joules, kilojoules, and calories, and wavelength and frequency problems with meters, nanometers, and hertz. Because these problems involve many different units, it's essential to have a reliable method for converting between them. And that's where dimensional analysis comes in. Dimensional analysis ensures your answers make sense with the correct units and your calculations are correct through your conversions. Whether you're converting grams to kilograms, nanometers to meters, or liters to cubic centimeters, the principles are the same. Just like in math, when we cancel out the same variable that is on top and on bottom, we can cancel out units that are the same on top and on bottom. Before we look at units that are specific to chemistry, we can explore how dimensional analysis will work for units that we have seen in our daily lives. For this example, we are going to convert 32 years into hours. We can jump straight from years to hours, but we can find the different relationships to these units that will connect them. From years, I can convert to days and then hours. There are 365 days in one year and 24 hours in one day. What I'm doing here is creating a unit map to help track the different units I will be converting to with their conversion factors. Conversion factors are ratios or fractions that express how one unit of measurement is related to another. They are used in dimensional analysis to convert values from one unit to another without changing the actual quantity. Now that I know the plan of how I will convert from years to hours, I'm going to set up all the conversion factors with the beginning value so they cancel out. Always start with the given value because it is specific to the problem you are trying to solve for. I will set up 32 years over 1 so I can have a fraction to be able to cancel out years. I have years on the top in my next fraction and I need years on the bottom so they cancel out. I will set up one year on the bottom and the other half of the conversion factor 365 days on the top. We do not split up conversion factors so they will always be together in a fraction, but we can invert the fraction if we need to. The years cancel out and I know I have days on top. I need to have days on the bottom in the next fraction to cancel them out. The other half of the conversion factor is 24 hours so this will now go on the top. It does not matter if the units are plural or singular, they're still going to cancel out. Days now cancel out and I am left with hours. The units that we need for our answer are hours, so we have stopped with the conversion factors that we need to cancel out. Now in the calculator, I'm going to multiply every number that is on top and divide by every number that is on bottom to reach the final value. We can ignore the ones because this will be an identity operation in math where the value remains unchanged. The answer is 280,320 hours, but with the correct number of sig figs from the given starting value 32, the answer will be 2.8 times 10 to the fifth hours. So when you're doing dimensional analysis, think of the units like algebraic variables. They follow the same rules. This helps you keep track of what's left in your final answer and ensures the unit matches the quantity you're solving for. To do this effectively, it's important to know what the standard or base units are for each type of measurement you'll encounter in chemistry. In chemistry, we are going to have base units. The base units are the fundamental units of measurement that are used to measure the basic physical quantities. To measure length, the base unit will be meters. To measure mass, the base unit will be grams. And to measure volume, the base unit is liters. However, in real-world chemistry, the values we measure don't always fall neatly into whole meters, grams, or liters. 
Sometimes they're incredibly large or extremely small. When values become very large or very small, we can add prefixes to these base units. We add prefixes to base units to make values easier to read, write, and understand. For example, instead of writing that an atom is 0.000000001 meters wide, we can write with a prefix that an atom is 0.1 nanometers wide. The prefixes that will be important to memorize are listed in the table. We can add these prefixes to any base unit that we have, but for the examples for our two different methods that we're going to be using, I'm going to use meters. There are two different methods you can use to convert between units using metric prefixes in chemistry. Both methods are equally valid, and one is not better than the other. I'll show you how to use both so you can choose the method that makes the most sense for you. In the table, we have prefix, symbol, multiple, and conversion factor. For giga, we have the symbol capital G, the multiple is 10 to the 9th, and the conversion will be 1 gigameter equals 1 times 10 to the 9th meters. For mega, we have the symbol capital M, the multiple is 10 to the 6th, and the conversion factor is 1 megameter equals 1 times 10 to the 6 meters. For kilo, we have a lowercase k, the multiple is 10 to the 3rd, and the conversion factor is 1 kilometer equals 1,000 meters. For hecto, we have lowercase h, the multiple is 10 squared, and the conversion factor is 1 hectometer equals 100 meters. For deca, we have lowercase da, the multiple is 10 to the first, and the conversion factor is 1 decameter equals 10 meters. For deci, we have lowercase d, the multiple is 10 to the negative first, and the conversion factor will be 10 decimeters equals 1 meter. For centi, we have lowercase c, the multiple is 10 to the negative second, and the conversion factor is 100 centimeters equals 1 meter. For milli, we have lowercase m, the multiple is 10 to the negative third, and the conversion factor is 1,000 millimeters equals 1 meter. For micro, we have lowercase u, the multiple is 10 to the negative sixth, and the conversion factor is 1 times 10 to the six micrometers equals 1 meter. For nano, we have lowercase n, the multiple is 10 to the negative ninth, and the conversion factor is 1 times 10 to the 9th nanometers equals 1 meter. For pico, we have lowercase p, the multiple is 10 to the negative 12th, and we have 1 times 10 to the 12th picometers equals 1 meter. In the first method, we identify a larger unit and a smaller unit. We use the idea that one of the larger unit equals a multiple of the smaller unit. The units are arranged on a metric scale, with larger units at the top, smaller units at the bottom, and the base unit in the middle. Once we know the prefix and its position on the scale, we can always write the conversion so that one larger unit equals 10 raised to a certain power of the smaller unit. That power of 10 will always be greater than 1, even if the exponent is negative, because we will always have more of the smaller unit to equal the larger unit. It's often easiest to convert through the base unit since that's the reference point where all prefix-based equivalents are defined. Let's apply this method by converting 3.5 kilometers to meters. We know that kilo means 10 to the third and the base unit is meters. Since kilometer is the larger unit, we write one kilometer equals 10 to the third meters or one kilometer equals 1,000 meters. Setting up our conversion, I'm going to write 3.5 kilometers over 1, and I need to have kilometers on the bottom in the next fraction to cancel them out. I'm going to set up 1 kilometer on bottom and 1,000 meters on top, cancel out the kilometers, and multiply 3.5 times 1,000 to get 3,500 meters. 3.5 kilometers had two significant figures, and 3,500 meters without a decimal place also has two significant figures, so this will be our answer. Next, we can look at converting between two different prefix units. In this example, we are going to convert from 250 milligrams to centigrams. 
To convert between two different prefix units, I'm going to use the base unit grams in between. Setting up the unit map, I have milligrams to grams to centigrams. From the table, there are 1,000 milligrams in 1 gram and 100 centigrams in 1 gram, and these will be our conversion factors that we'll add into our unit map. I next will set up all units to cancel, starting with 250 milligrams over 1. The next fraction will have milligrams on bottom to cancel out, so I will write 1,000 milligrams on bottom with 1 gram on top. The milligrams cancel out and I am left with grams. I next want to cancel out grams in the next fraction, so I will set up 1 gram on bottom and 100 centigrams on top. The grams cancel. Multiplying dividing all values, I get 25 centigrams with the correct number of significant figures. One way to remember the difference between larger and smaller metric prefixes, even if their exponents look similar, is by using visual comparisons. To help memorize the prefixes based on their magnitudes when you think of kilograms, think of how big elephants can be. You would only need one elephant or one kilogram to equal a thousand grams, the smaller base unit. When you think of milligrams, think of how small millipedes are. You would need a thousand millipedes or a thousand milligrams to equal one gram, the larger base unit. And since millipedes have more legs than centipedes, they represent a smaller unit than centipedes. So you would need more millipedes or a thousand milligrams than centipedes, a hundred centigrams, to equal one gram, the larger unit.